For a long time, we believed that human evolution followed a straight path. The more evolved, the more modern. Smaller-bodied hominins with limited brains would gradually disappear to make way for larger, more intelligent forms. In that view, every archaic human seemed to be nothing more than a lower step on the ladder, leading to Homo sapiens. Yet in 2013, after hours of crawling through narrow fissures, deep inside the Rising Star Cave, scientists discovered the existence of a strange and diminutive human species. They lived side by side with our ancestors, but as if they had somehow refused to evolve into modern humans. This discovery immediately raised a series of questions. Why did they exist? What mysteries surround the way they were found? and their silent disappearance. Two years later, in 2015, a human species was formally named after the very cave where their fossils had lain for hundreds of thousands of years. Homo naledi, a true rising star in the story of humankind. In 2013, a research team led by paleoanthropologist Lee Berger uncovered a massive assemblage of bones in the rising star cave system in South Africa. More than 1,500 fossil fragments representing at least 15 individuals were recovered from the Dinalidi chamber, a dark humid cavity more than 30 meters underground. Access to this chamber was extremely perilous. Some passages narrowed to just 20 centimeters, completely engulfed in darkness, forcing the scientists to crawl and squeeze their way through jagged rock. At first glance, based on skeletal morphology, many assume these fossils must date to one to two million years ago, belonging to an early Homo. But modern dating methods overturned all such assumptions. Homo naledi lived only 335,236,000 years ago, meaning they were contemporaneous with early Homo sapiens. This discovery immediately ignited debate about the origins of this peculiar human species. One hypothesis proposes that they branched off very early in the Pliocene and persisted independently until late in time. Others suggest they were a sister group to Homo erectus, sharing a common ancestor. Some researchers even argue that Homo naledi might represent a hybrid between an early Homo, such as erectus or heidelbergensis, and a late surviving Australopithecus. To date, However, none of these hypotheses has been confirmed as their DNA remains undeciphered. The recovered skeletons reveal that Homo naledi were modest in stature, averaging 1.43 meters tall, weighing 40 to 50 kilograms, roughly one-third smaller than modern humans. Yet their body structure was paradoxical, combining many archaic traits with surprisingly modern ones. Their elevated shoulders and cone-shaped ribcage immediately evoke Australopithecus adept at climbing and living in a semi-arboreal niche. Their long, curved fingers were even more specialized for climbing than in many Australopithecines. Strong shoulder muscles and elongated arms suggest they could climb vertically repeatedly, a capability rarely seen in later Homo. But alongside these primitive traits, Homo naledi possessed features strikingly human. Their large, powerful thumbs and sturdy wrists, reminiscent of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, enabled fine precision grips for manipulating or crafting tools. Their feet were virtually indistinguishable from modern humans, allowing long, efficient strides on two legs. Even their pelvis broad and archaic in form was counterbalanced by well-developed gluteal muscles, showing they were fully capable of sustained long-distance travel. Physiological estimates further underscore their physical prowess. Their grip strength reached 70 to 90 kgf, far exceeding many modern climbers. Arm pull forces approached 400, 500 newtons, and their VO2 max ranged between 50 to 55 million Lyoshui Q min, comparable to amateur endurance athletes today. In practice, they could climb like apes, yet stride tirelessly like humans, covering 15 to 25 kilometers daily, carrying an extra 20 to 30 percent of their body weight, while expending only 1,800 to 2,300 kilocalories 
far less than Homo sapiens. This curious blend has led many scientists to ask, was this a form of insular dwarfism akin to Homo floresiensis or Homo luzonensis? The difference is that Homo naledi did not live on an island, but in the heart of mainland Africa. Perhaps geographic isolation or unique environmental pressures push them down a very different evolutionary path from their Homo kin compelled them to compress their bodies into such a compact, energy-efficient, yet resilient form. If their bodies astonished by their mosaic of traits, their dentition adds another key piece to the puzzle. Their teeth were small, but with thick enamel-bearing archaic morphologies, more typical of early hominins than modern humans. This thick enamel made them durable, and many specimens show surfaces worn down to the dentine. Such wear reveals a harsh diet they habitually chewed roots, hard seeds, tree bark, even grit-laden foods. Remarkably, their dental eruption sequence followed a rhythm similar to ours rather than the slower pace of Australopithecus. This suggests that Homo naledi children may have grown at a tempo closer to later Homo. In other words, their teeth alone reveal two faces of naledi. On one hand, a lineage still marked by archaic signatures. On the other, a developmental trajectory edging closer to Homo sapiens. If their teeth reflect diet, their skulls and brains present an even greater paradox. Their cranial capacity was only 465 to 610 cubic centimeters, less than half that of Homo sapiens, even smaller than some chimpanzees. Yet, the shape of their skulls surprised scientists Instead of low and flat like Australopithecus, theirs were rounded high and compact posteriorly, resembling later Homo. Endocasts revealed that their cortex was not nearly as primitive as the volume suggested. The frontal lobes associated with planning behavioral regulation and even proto-language resembled those of Homo erectus and early sapiens. Their temporal lobes were expanded linked to auditory processing and social memory hinting at communicative potential. Even the occipital lobe governing vision was developed, reflecting sharp spatial awareness in rugged environments. Most strikingly, the area behind the orbits was not constricted as in archaic forms but expanded, a hallmark previously thought unique to Neanderthals and sapiens associated with abstract thought. All of this points to a crucial truth. It is not absolute brain size, but cortical organization that determines cognitive capacity. Homo naledi may have had small brains, but their structure was sufficiently modern to enable complex social behavior, perhaps planning and even rudimentary communication. In their small frames may have resided intellectual potential far greater than their cranial volume would suggest. What makes the story even stranger is that fossils of Homo naledi have so far been found only in the rising star system. None outside, none elsewhere, only within these dark limestone chambers. The Denalidae chamber alone contained over 15 individuals from infants to adults. Many remained articulated, lying intact. From the outset, scientists sought to solve the mystery the first hypothesis proposed that the remains had been swept in by a flash flood. Plausible at first, but sedimentological studies showed no evidence of strong flow or flood deposits. Another idea suggested the bones had been dragged in by carnivores like hyenas or leopards that cache prey. Yet the fossils bore no tooth marks, no gnawing, no carnivore traces, except for a single bird fossil. A third possibility was that they had fallen accidentally through a shaft above. But cave maps revealed no vertical shaft leading to Dinaliti, and the bones showed no trauma consistent with death from a high fall. A more cautious hypothesis asked whether the cave might once have had a wider entrance later sealed or narrowed by geological change. While appealing geological surveys have found no evidence of such large-scale collapse, Everything points instead to Dinaledi having always been difficult to access. 
The mystery deepened further in the Lacidi chamber, where archaeologists discovered the nearly complete skull of an adult, dubbed Neo, and the isolated skull of a child Letty placed apart in a peculiar position. So, how did these individuals end up in such an inaccessible place? 30 meters underground through passages barely 20 centimeters wide in pitch black stifling air. With natural explanations ruled out one by one, Berger's team concluded that Homo Naledi must have deliberately carried their dead into these chambers. If true, this would represent the earliest known burial behavior, over 300,000 years old, predating both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Such details have led many to favor the hypothesis that Homo Naledi possessed intentional social behavior far beyond what their small brains would imply. The controversy is precisely this paradox. How could a species with a brain only half our size organize such collective, purposeful treatment of the dead? Was it an embryonic symbolic awareness, a concern for mortality, or merely a pragmatic act to keep living spaces clean of corpses and disease? Homo naledi existed for only about 100,000 years before vanishing, leaving their sole trace in the darkness of Rising Star. Unlike Neanderthals or Denisovans, they left no genes in us, no clear evidence of interbreeding. Their exit was quiet like a small branch on the evolutionary tree that budded flourished briefly and then sealed shut unnoticed. What caused their disappearance? Perhaps the violent climatic fluctuations of the Pleistocene depleted their food supply imperiling a species reliant on roots and bark. Perhaps large predators, lions, hyenas, leopards, turned daily life into constant threat. And certainly competition with other Homo, Erectus and early sapiens with larger brains and more sophisticated tools, must have pressed Naledi into disadvantage. It is also possible they were always a small, isolated population with limited genetic exchange. In such harsh conditions, a few successive failures could have collapsed their numbers irreversibly. Since DNA has not been recovered from Rising Star, we cannot yet know whether Homo naledi vanished outright or blended into another human population, only to be erased by time. In the end, Homo naledi slipped quietly off evolution stage. Yet their silence troubles us. They were not mere ape men, but real individuals who lived, climbed, walked long distances, and perhaps cared for their dead. They did not refuse to evolve. They simply took a different path. To study them is to confront a larger question. Does evolution always favor the strongest? Or does it sometimes overlook other possibilities, other paths, like that of Homo naledi?